Welcome to ITU Telecom World 2016 in Bangkok, Thailand. I'm very pleased to be joined in the studio today by Professor Umar Garba Dambata, who is Executive Vice Chairman and CEO of the Nigerian Communications Commission. Professor Dambata, thank you very much indeed for being with us today. Thank you very much. My pleasure. Now, I'd like to start off by talking about uh, smart communities. Uh, I know it's, it's, a, it's a key message here, and perhaps we could uh, talk a little bit about the importance of it, particularly in Nigeria. To understand why um, this uh, project on smart communities is important, we need to look at the way legacy systems, processes, you know, and services are being run. We all agree that these are not being run very efficiently. And therefore, an alternative is needed that can be able to contain the destruction, the unintended destructive effect, you know, that this alternative would bring to legacy systems, processes, and so on and so forth, as well as ensure that, you know, there's improvement in effectiveness, in efficiency, you know, in productivity of what the legacy systems you know are doing. And there lies the argument for leveraging information and communications technology and bringing it to VIA, you know, in the way and manner we, 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 you know, we are doing things using legacy processes and systems. The whole purpose is to ensure efficiency, effectiveness, at the same time being able to contain the unintended effect of destruction of these processes. You know, such is the power of argument in favor of leveraging ICTs, you know, to run processes, services, you know, as well as, you know, other related issues, you know, governance, in fact, you know, for, you know to a large extent, that people are saying it is possible to do this, to transform the way we do things, you know, using, you know, legacy processes and systems, you know, as well as be able to contain the unintended destructive, uh, destructive effect that, you know, smart, you know, systems, you know, bring with them. So the, the argument will be in favor of full-scale adoption of smart, you know, processes, or a gradual way of doing it. I think in Nigeria, we have started experiencing this. We, we would like to do it, you know, not, not, not by going the whole hog. We, we are trying to go for pilot projects during which we can be able to test the efficacy, you know, of smart processes. And then from there, the argument, you know, for adopting you know, the, the, you know the, 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 the smart, you know, systems in their entirety, you know, would have been made, you know, from what successes, you know, are recorded, you know, through the adoption in a peace meal approach of smart, you know, um, processes, you know, in our, pro you know, I mean, st smart systems, smart processes, and so on and so forth. What single factor do you think is most important in stimulating ICT adoption? Well, I think, uh, first of all, we need to again, it's a related question to the first. You know, the, what do we, what, what are we trying to do? We all know what ICTs can do. The argument has been made, okay, that they, 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 they can improve tremendously efficiency, effectiveness, and ensure productivity. More than, you know, the way we are doing things, without, you know, leveraging the power of ICTs. So the whole essence of adoption of ICT hinge, you know, on the need to improve efficiency, efficacy, as well as productivity in things, you know, that we are doing on a day-to-day -day basis. We want to be able to do those things better, effectively, and efficiently. And what role do you think regulation can play in driving digital financial services? Well, we need to look at the ecosystem in Nigeria. I'm not saying it is the same in every, in every country. The ecosystem that, you know, drives financial inclusion now is one consistent of 
principally two elements, the banking sector, okay, and the financial regulator, incidentally, which is not, you know, the, the Nigerian Communications Commission. And the results are there for all to see that the mobile money service penetration is too low. It's only 1%, which confers unpaperably with 60% for Kenya. Then you need to ask, then how is effective, how effective is this bank-driven money mobile service? Obviously, if that is the kind of penetration you know we have in Nigeria, and then all of a sudden, the opportunities that we have or offered by telecommunications companies in Nigeria, together with the fantastic, you know, statistics that are there for all to see, you know, becomes very, very relevant. If such services could possibly be extended to drive the money mobile service, um, you, know, in, you know, in Nigeria. Now, but then we have been very careful do we have capacity to bring this additional burden to the telecommunications sector? And I'm talking about capacity in terms of infrastructure. So what, what, what did we do? We understand the importance of mobile money service to rural communities, underserved communities, as well as communities that are even unserved with telecommunication services. We would like to see communities participate in this very, very important, you know, inclusive initiative, empowerment of, you know, rural communities, you know, irrespective of where the communities are and what the, their circumstances are. So, all of a sudden then, the need to collaborate, okay, to widen the ecosystem, to include maybe the telecommunication companies, the financial regulator, you know, as well as the users you know, becomes imperative. And so that is the stage that Nigeria is now. The telecommunications companies in Nigeria are willing to serve as super agents to drive the mobile mo uh, money services in Nigeria. The regulator is saying, I need to be convinced that you have capacity, okay, so that the complaints we are getting about poor quality of service are not aggravated by bringing additional burden to bear on the telecommunications infrastructure. Once we can address and sort out this, you know, little problems, then I would like to see a situation where the telecommunications companies with their, you know, uh, with, their, with their good records of providing, you know, telecommunication services, bring that same experience to via to the money, uh, money mobile service, you know, industry. And perhaps we'll see the statistics, you know, changing for the better. Finally, I would be very impressed by Nigeria's pavilion here. Uh, there's a, a lot of uh, interest in that, but obviously a lot of interest uh, in being here in general. I wanted to find out from you, what's the value of attending events such as ITU Telecom World? Well, this is um, a very, very collaborative event. There is a facilitation of collaboration where we can be able to learn from global best practices, you know? And um, those uh, global best practices are what we bring to bear in, you know, uh, the regulations, you know, we, we, we make in Nigeria, courtesy of, you know, frameworks, as you are aware, cutting across, you know, the major areas of regulation, competition, spectrum administration, you know, uh, licensing and authorization and so on and so forth. Also, this event, offers an opportunity for Nigeria to make you know, its case to the international telecommunications audience so that through this engagement, we can be able to woo the investors that we need to continue to make the telecom sector more vibrant, more resilient, as well as provide better, efficient, and you know, qualitative services. Professor Tampata, thank you very much indeed. Thank you very much, I appreciate this engagement. Well, I won't be, I won't put that simply as that. There's an element of that. Um, there's an element of, uh, there's an internal element which you have uh, mentioned, uh, the 
inadequate education in the north or in fact inadequate education generally in the country, um, inadequate uh, employment opportunities in the country, uh, all, all that are part of uh, what is the, if you like, remote cause of uh, Boko Haram as far as I'm concerned. But then there are also uh, external elements. Now, the fallout from Libya, and uh, which, of course, as a result of what happened in Libya, those that have been trained in Libya in the time of Gaddafi from other countries uh, who are, are neighbors of Libya, um, are they, when, when, when Gaddafi fell, they moved out. They moved out with their training, their, uh, their uh, weapons, and um, they, 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 start, they started to uh, wreak havoc on the communities in which they have moved out to. And that is the situation in northern Mali. Chief Ambassador Joe, if I get you correctly, what you're saying is the overthrow of Gaddafi uh, is the result has been what we saw recently with the killing of the U.S. ambassador, with the instability in northern Mali, with Boko Haram. Is that the connection you're drawing? There is, uh, there is connection. Uh, and we know that there would be a price to pay uh, in the way that uh, it all went in Libya. That at the end of the day, all of us in Africa and all those who masterminded the way it happened, we have to pay a price. And we are now paying the price. So as you were watching the euphoria surrounding the Arab Spring unfold, you were one of those individuals who felt, hang on for a minute, this is not going to play out the way some people may expect. Now, we were too, it was too early to shout uh, Uhuru with the Arab Spring. And, and, and some of us said that. That look, what would be the final outcome of this? Let us wait and see. Uh, when you have um, violence and violent overthrow of regimes, you do not know exactly what the final outcome will be.